We're going to be in Genesis chapter 22 this morning. If you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, we'll be looking at a few verses there. Um, while you're turning there, let me share with you an announcement that I neglected to make a moment ago. But if I don't tell you, you won't know. And we have a baptism in today's 11 o'clock service. And I know that's always a reason to celebrate, but you don't get to see that in the 830 service. So I want to let you know, we do have a baptism of a, of a young man, a nine-year-old boy, who, who the Lord's been working his heart for, for, uh, for some time. And that was confirmed again this year at VBX. So uh, we're uh, looking forward to that baptism. And we have two baptisms scheduled for next Sunday also. And again, that will be in the 11 o'clock class, so if that, if, uh, the 11 o'clock service. If that's something that you really like to see, uh, the good news is for you who attend the 830 service that we, uh, we do the baptisms very first thing in the service. So you're more than welcome to stick around for that 11 o'clock service for the baptism and then uh, slip out while no one's looking so that you can uh, celebrate with us. Um, I met with a couple this week, a young family, where the husband and wife also are very strongly cons uh, considering baptism. I think we're going to baptize them pretty soon. So a lot of exciting things happening there. Uh, I mentioned all of that so that you can know and celebrate with me. Also, I say it because you never know, there may be somebody here this morning and God's been working in your heart about baptism. And so if that's, uh, if that's the case, I would love to speak with you. Please feel the freedom uh, to come and find me after the service, uh, to give me a call during the week or shoot me an email or something like that. There's really nothing more I'd rather talk about with you than what God's doing in your life. And so if you think maybe you need to be baptized, I would like to talk with you about that. Um, we're in Genesis 22 this morning, and I want to tell you about something that's deeply personal for me. Sometimes God speaks to you in your life in ways that are almost too big to be described. Sometimes we have a meeting with God and God's Holy Spirit just comes really close to us and we sense his presence and we feel his arms of comfort wrap around us and we just feel God's Holy Spirit speaking to us, talking into the deepest parts of our lives. And um, I've had that happen a few times in my life, just a few times, and when it happens, it's as if God puts a marker right there, uh, a milestone of sorts in your soul. And so whenever you pass by that way again, you're reminded all over again of what God did in your life when he spoke to you so deeply. And so I wanna share with you a passage of scripture that for me has become that sort of a marker in my life. That's Genesis 22, and we're gonna read in a moment the first 19 verses there. Um, this is a passage that is about how you go through different seasons in your life. And so I wanna take Genesis 22 and preach to you a sermon I've titled, When Seasons Change. Every single person here this morning is going through some sort of season in their life. We could put all sorts of different uh, descriptive terms on what that season is or what it feels like for you. I wanna highlight the character of Abraham and a story that's one of the most significant in his life and the types of seasons that he went through in the course of, uh, of this story. And so, you know, in our lives, sometimes a season changes on the inside of our hearts such that on the outside, it may not appear like anything has changed, but on the inside, God has done something monumental. And so again, from the outside, it may not look to others like anything's changed, but on the inside between us and God, we know really everything has changed. And so that's what we have here in Genesis chapter 22. And I wanna work through the passage fairly quickly and then just share with you what I think are some words of wisdom regarding a particular season in our lives. So would you notice with me, we'll read our passage as we make our way through our outline this morning, but notice with me, first season that Abraham goes through is a season of testing. A season of testing. Look at me at verses one down through verse number 10. Again, we're in Genesis 22. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham. He tested him. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham answered. Take your son, he said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey and 
took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and then he set out to go to the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young man, his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship and then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife and the two of them walked on together. And then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and he said, my father. He replied, here I am, my son. Isaac said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And then the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there. He arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out and he took the knife to slaughter his son. Abraham indeed went through a season of testing. Our passage begins and it says so clearly, God tested Abraham. The word that's used there to test, it means to try something out. It means to, to try and prove whether something is strong or worthy. It's similar to the idea of testing precious metals. So for example, if you were to take a number of gold necklaces and each of the necklaces had a different quality of gold and if you were to take a lighter and burn those necklaces from one end to the other, the very cheap gold necklaces would turn all black and sooty but the finer materials would come out shining and strong. That's what it means to test a precious metal. In a similar way, God will put us through seasons in our lives where he holds us to a fire and he tests, God's word will say elsewhere, the genuineness of our faith. In fact, Peter says it this way, 1 Peter 1 verses six and seven, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that, and here's our language, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, even though it's tested by fire, the tested genuineness of your faith may be found a result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, sometimes God will allow us to go through seasons in our life where he wants to see what we're really all about. And he tests us. James says in James chapter one, verse two and following, count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. The language of trials that God puts us through and the language of the testing that God sometimes will put us through seasons of, that language often is found together. James says then, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let that steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In other words, God's word teaches early in stories like what we read in Genesis 2 and then throughout his scriptures, uh, through the apostles and writers like what we've just read, God teaches regularly that he often finds in our life that we have a need of testing and, and there's a promise contained in the testing. The promise is this, there's something in your life that God wants to prove and on the other side of that season of testing, if we'll just be faithful, if we'll just be humble, if we will just, when it, when it matters most, when it hurts the most, if we will just endure the season of testing, on the other side, God says we will be made complete or 
perfect. The word there, perfect, it means there's, there's this idea of what God wants us to be. And there's no other way for us to get there than to go through a season of testing. It's no coincidence that James says, count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you meet with trials of various kinds. He had to remind us to count it all joy because it does not feel like joy. God wants you to remember when you're going through difficulties and, and in particular when you're going through a season of testing that God has ordained and that God has allowed. When you go through that season of testing, God's word says, all right, keep your eyes on the prize. God is at work. He will not desert you there in the desert of testing. Hold on, stand fast, and trust God. Abraham went through this season of testing. I could tell you more about all the details in our passage, but, but I warned you earlier that I'm going to try to make it through this passage quickly. But the language that's used in these first 10, 10 verses is really intended to convey for us just how much of an ordeal this was for Abraham. It wasn't some small thing. We often are tempted to read a passage like this and not see the drama and the angst of the characters involved. But trust me, it was there. Notice with me also, God led Abraham out of a season of testing into a season of provision. That's really the second marker in our passage. Look at verse 11. Remember when we first, when we left off reading, it said Abraham reached out and he took the knife to slaughter his son. Verse 11 says, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and he said, Abraham, Abraham. He wanted to get his attention and <laughs> Abraham was glad that he did. He says, here I am. And God said to Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now, I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and he saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And so Abraham went and he took the ram and he offered it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. So today it is said, it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Aren't you thankful that even though God sometimes sees fit to take us through a season of testing, he always meets our needs and a season of provision comes along. This was the most vulnerable moment of Abraham's life. And God showed up and he gave him just what he needed. In the most dangerous, the most risk-taking moment of his life, when he trusted God completely, God showed up and he says, no, 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 no. You don't need to make the sacrifice. I will provide the sacrifice. In verse 14, it says that Abraham responded with the language of the Lord will provide. If you've ever done a study of the names of God, we see here the name of God, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, the God who sees our needs, knows how to meet those needs and in the right time, when it's just God's time for the season to change, God provides. And that moment, the Lord will provide, that moment would become a testament in the life of Abraham for, for, for the rest of his days, no matter what he was facing, because God saw fit to take him through a season of testing, because in faith and humility, he endured and trusted God more than anything else, he would always have that testimony of faith, God will meet my needs. And so you could imagine in Abraham's life, say fast forward a year or two years, when he met with some other trial, Maybe when he goes through some other season of testing, he could always look back and say, God, I, I know now, looking back of the purpose you had in mind. I know now, looking back of how you were in charge of every single uh, scenario. I know now that you had me go through this season of testing and that you provided and everything was okay. So today, if I'm facing another season of testing, I'll lean on that testimony 
to say God has provided for me before, God will provide for me again. Dear brothers and sisters, if you're going through a season of testing in your life right now, can you remember God's blessings? Can you remember times in your life when God transitioned you out of that testing and provided? Remember those things. The devil would have you forget. The devil would have you question. God wants you to remember. That's what those wonderful seasons of provision were all about. Would you notice with me finally a season of blessing? A season of blessing. Verse 15 down through the rest of our passage will tell us what would come of this. It says in verse 15, and then the angel of the Lord called to Abram a second time from heaven and he said, by myself I have sworn and this is the Lord's declaration because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you. I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the city gates of their enemies and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. And then Abraham went back to his young men. They got up and they went together to Beersheba and there Abraham settled in Beersheba. This, <laughs> this most memorable of moments in his life, this testing, this provision, now this pronouncement of blessing. And now, after all of the tumult of those seasons changing, Abraham goes back and he must live his life, his simple, humble life of faith. And what we see in the blessing here is actually a really big Blessing. God's trial for, for Abraham was a trial of faith, a trial of trust. God's promise to Abraham, the promise of a son, right? I'm reading in here to our story of all that's transpired in the last 10, 10 chapters or so leading us up to Genesis chapter 22. But God's great promise, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Even in, in you and your wife's old age, I'm going to give you a son. And God promised that he would bless the whole world through that son. And in their old age, God gave them that son only to test them with this, with this scenario of a sacrifice to see if truly Abraham was trusting God for who God was, trustworthy, provider, or just for what he thought God could give to him, a son. And Abraham showed where his trust was. It was in the person, in the faithfulness, in the provision of Almighty God. We see God's provision, a ram caught in the thicket, and we see God's blessing to the whole world. You, you understand, Abraham's son Isaac would go on and he would have kids. One of those kids would be named Jacob, who through after an amazing encounter with God himself would also go by another name you've probably heard, the name Israel. And he would have 12 sons who would uh, eventually lead to the 12 tribes of Israel through whom and from whom our great Messiah would be delivered to the world. And so when God made a promise, I'm going to give you a son and through your lineage, the whole world will be blessed. God knew exactly what he was doing. And yet there were still great and difficult seasons of testing to be endured along the way. What I want to do with the rest of our time this morning, again, I told you I wanted to move through the passage pretty quickly. I just wanted to highlight a few things about seasons of testing in our life. Some of you this morning are going through those testings right now. Some of you are going through those seasons and maybe, maybe many, maybe most of us have no idea that you're going through those seasons. God knows. Jehovah Jireh, it doesn't just mean the Lord will provide, it means essentially the Lord sees. So I wanna tell you who are going through a season of testing this morning, God sees you. He sees exactly what you're going through. He knows the need in his time, will you trust him that he will meet that great need? And so what I wanna share with you here at the end of our sermon is a few words about God's testing in our life. I just wanna ruminate a little, both from the pages of scripture and from personal experience, what it's like when we endure seasons of testing. The first word that comes to mind is the word pain. Testing is never easy. It hurts. 
And if you think, I'm strong, I can face anything that comes my way. Well, let me tell you, you probably need a couple seasons of testing to humble you in your faith with God. Can you imagine what Abraham went through? Having heard so clearly the call of God, knowing all that it entailed and following through. It was a three days journey from where God gave him that call and that command to where ultimately he would be on Mount Moriah. And you can only imagine every step of that journey, each day of that journey, we could only imagine the grueling thoughts that went through his mind. But I I want you to know, if you're in that season of testing, God sees the pain, God cares about you and the pain in your life. He has already made provision. And if we could see from his vantage point, we would see the provision. We would see the timing. We would understand just how perfectly it all makes sense. Seasons change. Hold on to the promise of a faithful God. The second word that comes to mind when we think about testing is the word private. I say that because no one knows the pain that you have endured in your heart when you have gone through seasons of testing. No one. Now, you can share that. You can talk about that with friends or with your spouse. And yet no one knows exactly what it's like except for you and your God. The seasons of testing we endure are incredibly private affairs. No one knew the agony that Abraham must have experienced as he obeyed God's command and endured the testing. Most commentators suggest, though they're reading between the lines somewhat, Abraham didn't tell Sarah. I can imagine mom would have had something to say about the whole ordeal. It was a very private affair. One theologian had this to say about the experience. No one else knows about it. Abraham comes down from the mountain with Isaac. Okay, not just the experience of how hard it was, but also the experience of God's provision and blessing. No one knows that either the same way that we know it on the other side of our testing. This theologian said, Abraham comes down from the mountain with Isaac just as he went up. Two of them went up, two of them come down. But everything had changed. Christ came between the father and the son. Abraham had left everything to follow Christ. And while he was following Christ, he was permitted to go back and to live in the same world he had lived in before. Externally, everything remained the same, but the old had passed away. Everything had become new in his life because our God, a provider, Our God who blesses saw him through that season of testing. You know, I wonder, the servants, remember there there was two particular young men who were servants who were there for every part of the experience except for what happened on top of that mountain. The servants may not have known anything about it other than that Abraham was acting a little funny on the way there and that he walked with a lighter step on the way home. From their vantage point, they saw a father and a son go up on a mountain, and they saw the same father and son come down from that mountain. But we know from God's word, everything changed on that mountain. Notice with me the third word to describe God's testing in our life, the word purpose. For the child of God, there is always purpose in our pain. Because God is in control and because God is good. Sometimes our greatest pain is inseparably linked to our life's greatest purpose. One author from whom I've benefited much is a guy named Randy Alcorn. I read where he was sharing about some personal devotional practices in his life. And he talked about how he always kept a list of prayer requests. And it was always on a simple sheet of paper. And on the front of that sheet of paper, he would write out the prayer request. You know, sometimes it was for people. Sometimes it was for difficult situations. He was going through seasons of testing, if you will. And on the back of that sheet of paper, he would always make a point to go back and write down what happened, the answers, how God provided. Here's what he said over and over again. 
the things in my life that hurt the most were also the things that God used the most. There is purpose in your pain. If you're here this morning and you're hurting, would you take that pain to Jesus and just say, Jesus, I trust you. I trust you that this pain is not pointless, but that there is a purpose. As it turns out, a relationship with Jesus gives all the purpose that we will ever have in this life, including the purpose we will find in our pain. Would you notice with me fourthly the word power? God works in amazing ways when we endure seasons of testing. When we're, when we're enduring those seasons, it exposes our weakness. And you know, the Bible has a lot to say about our weakness and God's power. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 speaks about it so eloquently. Verses seven and following, the apostle Paul tells this account. He says, and so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a pain, a season of testing. He described it further as a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But here's what God said to me. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, Paul concluded, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Would you notice with me two final words? The next word is the word personal. We've already hinted at this some, but when we endure seasons of testing, it is for us. It is for us to endure. And in those seasons, we have an opportunity to experience our personal relationship with God in a different way. I would even argue perhaps in the most intimate way possible. When God meets you in your pain and says, I am here. I will help you. I care about you. Everything it will be okay. We noticed that there was a difference in the language that Abraham used as he referred to God. And I don't think that that's just a coincidence. As Abraham begins to head up the mountain, he uses a very uh, general term for God. But when he's on the mountain, he uses a very specific name for God, the personal name of God. There in his pain, there in the provision, there in the blessing, Abraham's personal relationship with God grew as he was tested. Would you notice the final word this morning? It's the word provision. Again, we've hinted at it already. But when you go through a season of testing, if you trust God, there will always be provision. You say, well, I don't see any way out of this situation. I, I can't imagine a scenario wherein God could fix this. Well, that's okay. You're not him. He can do it. It's a good thing it's not up to you to come up with how to solve the problems in your life. You trust him. He can do it. There's a, a saying that the Lord gave me a few years ago, which has helped me so much. God can do more in a moment than we could do in a lifetime. Trust him. A lifetime of toil, of, of uh, relationship working, of, of ideas and brainstorming. It's nothing compared to the power of God. God can do more in an instant than really all of us put together could do in all of our lifetimes. And so we trust him that he will provide. The angel, the angel of God said to Abraham, behold, a ram caught in a thicket. Behold. And he looked and he saw God's provision. It's no coincidence that many years later, in a place not far from where Abraham was, John the Baptist would see Jesus coming on the scene and he would say, behold, the lamb, God's great provision. The Lord has not left you alone. The Lord sees what you need and God will meet the need in your life. As we close this morning, 
I want to remind you it took three days for Abraham to reach the mountain God had called him to, to offer up this sacrifice. Three days. On day one, you could imagine there's a commitment to do what God had said, though there's lots of questions. On day two, you could imagine he started maybe to get a little tired from the journey and yet he still didn't understand. On day three, he could feel the moment of sacrifice growing closer and closer. And you can only imagine the nerves, the pain, the, the, the confusion, the utter sense of despair for what should I do? How will God respond? Each day was different. And so I just want to ask the question, if you're here this morning and you're going through a season of testing, I wonder what day you're on. I wonder, has your season of testing just started? And you, you're feeling the pain and you think, well, this is difficult, but, you know, I've got a set of fresh legs and I'm ready to meet this challenge. Are you on day two? Have you really grown tired of the experience and you're not sure if you'll be able to make it and see it through to the end. Are you on day three? Is your season of testing so excruciating that you're just not sure you can handle anymore? I want to tell you, don't give up. Because as every day grew more and more difficult, as Abraham grew more and more tired, he got that much closer to God's provision and God's blessing if you're here this morning and you're going through a season of testing, then you need to respond to our message today in prayer. God, would you give me faith? God, would you give me the spiritual strength and energy to stay the course through this season? If you're here today and you know I'm in that testing now, you need to pray and ask for God's strength. If you know someone and they're going through a season, would you pray for them here at the end of our services? We have the opportunity to respond. Would you pray for them? If you're here this morning though and you've seen God's hand of blessing, you've seen God provide, you need to let your response be one of praise and you just thank God for what he's done in your life. Let me ask you to bow your heads this morning. While your heads are bowed, I just wanna invite you to think about the seasons in your life. What season are you in? Will you trust God today with what he's called you to? If you're here this morning and you're going through an especially difficult part of your journey with God, would you just cry out in your heart, Jesus, give me the strength I need to trust you in this season of testing. Dear brother or sister, it will all be worth it. God will provide. You will see his hand. You will hear from him. If you're here this morning and you've never given your heart to Jesus, Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. He is God's great provision and blessing for you. Would you trust him today? Trust in Jesus. He loves you.